Eina mana, eina reo, e rau rangatira mā tene te mihi ki e koutou, i te kopapa o te rā tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā ratatou katoa. Welcome to Te Honona, uh, the meeting place where we gather here this evening. Uh, thank you for coming to this event, which is part of the Christchurch Conversations program. Uh, Christchurch Conversations provide opportunities to hear from local and international thought leaders to inspire and challenge us um, and, and to make us think outside the square and to prompt bold approaches to the future of our city. It's a great forum for our local city makers to come together and share good ideas and it's a chance for everyone to be a part of the conversation about our city's future. Tonight's event is presented by the Christchurch City Council in association with Pu, um, Te Putahi Christchurch Centre for Architecture and City Making, as well as the New Zealand Institute of Architects and Regenerate Christchurch. I'm delighted to welcome Jason Twill to Christchurch. Jason is spending several days here this week to experience the city, and um, we've turned on some great weather for you, I think. Um, Jason will be speaking to us about how the sharing economy and collaborative consumption are enabling more affordable living standards um, in tier one cities across the world. Now the format for this evening um, actually is, is going to be a little bit different. Uh, we're gonna have uh, Jason's presentation and then that's gonna be followed by a Q and A facilitated by Councillor Raf Manji. Just a little, more, but little bit more about Jason before I hand over to him. With a career spanning over 18 years in sustainable property development, Jason has been at the forefront of built environment transformation. His development experience includes delivery of green mixed income housing projects throughout New York City, uh, South Lake Union Innovation District in Seattle, our sister city, um, and sustainability and innovation advisor for Lendlease, um, Landlease and Lendlease, sorry, in Australia. In 2016, Jason was appointed Innovation Fellow within the Department of Design, Architecture and Building at the University of Technology, Sydney. Jason leads research into sustainable urbanism, housing affordability and green building economics. Jason is Director of Urban Apostles, a startup real estate development and consulting services business specialising in alternative workplace and housing models. He is a co-founder of both the International Living Future Institute and Green Sports Alliance and originator of the Economics of Change project. Um, Jason was designated a lead fellow by the United States Green Building Council in 2014, was named a 2015 and 2017 Next City Urban Vanguard and is an appointed champion and advisor to Nightingale Housing in Australia. Please give a warm Christchurch welcome to Jason Twill. <laughs> Right? <laughs> <laughs> so before I begin, kia ora everybody. Um, say, ko Jason Twill toku ingoa, no New York o, ko George Twill toku matua, ko Linda T Taffel toku fire. I belong to the earth, papa tua nuku, and I'm in service to life, Māori. Um, <laughs> Thank you for that. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, and thank you guys for hosting me here. I've been here for, since Sunday afternoon, and I've already fallen in love with your city. You have an amazing place. And before I get into it, I don't want to pretend to be the international expert sitting here telling you how, you know, how to do things in your city. You guys are the expert. I'm visiting your land, your country, your city, and I'm learning a lot from you guys. It's rare that I can come to a city and usually I do this presentation, there's not a lot of examples on the ground where I'm talking. You guys are doing a lot of amazing stuff and you should be proud of it. Um, given the circumstances that you guys have had, had to deal with in the last seven years. Um, I cannot relate to going through an earthquake. Um, I can relate to being in Tower 2 and 9-11 and surviving a catastrophe like that. Um, I know what it's like to lose friends. I know what it's like to lose a chunk of our city. I do not know what it's like to lose a home. I do not know what it's like to lose a chunk of the landscape of a city. Um, so I have a lot of compassion now as I walk around the city and see kind of 
the fortitude, the imagination, um, the reinvention of your city. It's, it's a beautiful place to walk through. Um, but this notion of where we are at cities, uh, I always start with a question. And it's a very unique city to ask this question in. Um, raise your hand if you're frustrated by the kind of development happening around you in your city. Um, I've been asking that question for four years straight. We're not doing cities right right now. Um, the way we've structured the property markets, the way we've structured speculation in housing and land and all the other kind of assets we do in property, is creating some really perverse outcomes around the world, mainly because we're not doing it from a citizen-driven perspective or a community-driven perspective. It's a very industry-led model. Um, so I started talking about or teaching in collaborative urbanism a few years ago, mainly when I was in Seattle. Um, I'm really passionate about equity and inclusion. So my talk tonight is not about innovation districts. It's not about smart cities. I've done a lot of that work with cities around the world. It's how we get equity and inclusion right. How do we build cities for the 99%? How do we take care of all of our citizens, including our indigenous citizens? Um, and collaborative urbanism is just a, a moniker I came up with to look at how citizen community-led outcomes coupled with the sharing economy can drive more total livability more cost of living impact and how we can really change the landscape of cities and make it more inclusive and accessible to everybody. This is the challenge we face. We're stuck in this kind of capitalistic structure for the property industry where we have a very strong over-reliance on speculative land development. When we look at highest and best use analysis and developer-led models in cities, which are needed to drive an economy, so they're, it's great, but we're, we're imbalanced if everything's going towards the top end of the market, highest and best use for housing, highest and best use for commercial office, highest and best use for retail, you kind of get the same kind of outcome every time. It's very risk averse. When you do speculative land development, you're take, making a lot of assumptions and taking a gamble with time and money, and you're taking a lot of risk, which requires a lot of profit. Hence, there's a lot of high profit requirements when you do speculative development. What you're seeing around the world is a kind of a response to counteract this and rebalance it in cities that are really seeing the negative impacts of this, meaning the more reliance we have on speculative development models, the more we erode our cultural capital, the more we lose our creative industry people, the more we lose our artists, the more we lose our teachers, our key workers that, that make our city function. So it's causing a lot of stress and problems for the cities that are trying to kind of emerge in this 21st century economy. So cities that are starting to take a leadership role in this are trying to balance this out by enabling citizen-led or community-led or government-led development models um, that kind of take the speculation out of the equation. Um, it takes away the tension between profit, sustainability, livability, and affordability. Um, and unlocks and kind of rebalances a, a, a much more diverse populace that you can create with those models. When you have this kind of globalized, you know, approach to property with investment coming from all over the world, architects coming down and developing their towers in your city, you get a very commoditized and globalized look of buildings. This is more extreme, but it's a franchise approach where I can pick up a, an office building or a, an apartment tower in Sydney, I can drop it in New York, I can put it in Singapore, I can put it in Berlin. It all looks the same. So we're losing our cultural identity in the way that architecture and urban form tell the story of a place. What I love when I came through Christchurch the first day, Josie drove me around after the airport, and I always like to look at how you can tell the value sets of a city through its skyline or the way it kind of builds its city. And when I first drove through, my first impression was like, wow, the city really appreciates art. Wow, it really appreciates its public domain. Wow, it appreciates food urban agriculture, it appreciates architecture. How do you keep that, though, as you grow? That's the challenge. <laughs> um, as more and more investment and rapid urbanization come into cities, you know, housing has dominated that model. And you get a very kind of shape and drape, boring kind of architecture that kind of gets rep repeated all the time because it's, it's risk averse, it's safe, people know it. It's state agents telling you what the market wants. You're being driven by that. Um, and I think it limits the creativity of our architects and urban designers and cities. So we need to change that. Um, it's really unlocking our obsession 
an addiction to housing as a commodity for wealth and looking at it at home. It's not a product. Um, in the United States, the developers I worked for in New York and Seattle, um, just from a company philosophy, it wasn't a regulatory issue with the government. We limited an investor. Um, we sold only 20% of our units to investors. You had to be an owner-occupier for 80% of the building because we wanted to drive a community outcome. We wanted to make sure there was strong governance on the board of the apartment buildings that would be established. Um, when I moved down to Australia, it was like completely opposite, <laughs> um, where we were selling 95 plus percent of the building to foreign investors and creating really poor place outcomes when you have a lot of transient population, a lot of empty towers in the city, it's not driving the right retail and ground plane outcomes, there's not a good sense of custodianship of place when you have a lot of transient populations coming through. Um, so it's kind of unlocking this thing that, uh, you know, a home is a security box to make money off of as a product, but it's a place for us to live and connect with each other. Um, what you're seeing happen with this metropolitan pressure um, from a U.S. perspective as a kind of a harbinger to what may happen down here, and I'm not sure if it's happening here yet, um, it is happening in Australia, um, and I, I'm gonna, I kind of do this because it's a personal story of mine. I'm an urban refugee from New York City because I had a child and we could not afford to live in New York with a kid. <laughs> it's a pain in the butt. But we had a plethora of other cities to choose from. So a lot of my generation, Gen X, kind of left New York, L.A., San Francisco, Chicago. And we kind of flooded into these Tier 2 cities and Tier 3 cities like Seattle, Portland, Austin, Texas, um, Nashville, which had great culture, great nightlife, great food, unique identity, good art scenes. And a lot of us, you know, creative artists left these cities and moved here. So a lot of the, well, you're, this is over the last, like, 15, 10, 15 years. So the most, you know, hottest property markets in the country now are Austin and Seattle. Because when all that talent flowed out of New York, San Francisco, Chicago, Apple followed them, Google followed them, Microsoft followed them. So you're seeing this massive boom in those cities, but they didn't plan for that growth. Austin hates its growing like that. Its moniker is to keep it weird, and it's harder to keep it weird and weird when all this investment's coming in, and you're seeing you know, the heavy weight of capital come in and transforming that city um, and making it really commoditized. Um, so there's a lot of pressure in how they kind of put the mechanisms in to stem the tide of speculative development in those cities. And they have a challenge ahead of them. There's already getting the people that have been there forever or they were renting can't buy in the market and they're getting priced out moving into other cities. So this is flow-on effect. Um, the challenge in Australia and New Zealand, I would say, is you don't have as many cities to flow over to. Um, so more often than not, when I talk to um, civic leaders in Australia, the, their children are moving over to Singapore, they're moving over to the U.S., they're moving over to Europe. So we're losing that talent overseas. London last year lost 80,000 of its residents. People just can't afford to live in London anymore. It's a huge problem. Um, where there's the most housing stress come the most radical models for changing the way we live in cities. So there's some good examples of how London's trying to deal with that later in this presentation. What's important with this indicator is that urban economists usually equate 22 new residents to a city equals a new business which is vital to the, the tax and economic development of a city. So when you lose that many people, you're losing a good, you're losing your global competitive advantage and competitiveness. There's also a massive generational change in aspirations for how people want to live in cities. You have the experienced generation coming up the ranks behind this, the millennials, um, Gen Z. Um, we're building, a lot of the urban regeneration, if you're doing big projects and you guys have a long-term road ahead of you as you rebuild, rebuild your city center, you're building for a lot of this generation. So your planning, you know, it really has to account for a changing aspiration for urban life. Um, people looking for more richer experiences, people looking for different communal ways of living, um, not having to own as much stuff, maybe not having to own a home at all, and I'll talk about some of those models. Um, and there's this immune response to this disease of inaffordability in cities. So people that are staying in the city and really diehards, and you know, probably don't have kids, young couples, double income, or single people that just want to stay in their city of choice, like New York or London, are figuring out really inventive ways to create a livable, affordable way to stay there. Um, and colonizing old buildings, creating new forms of living. Um, and we'll talk about those. And what I love about it is this co-creation. 
So when you do deliberative development or citizen-led housing or community-led housing, this idea of co-creation. So it's not just the unilateral vision of a developer, the unilateral vision of a planning authority, but really deep community-led engagement, community-generated outcomes for a place. You get a lot of really creative ways to build your city that speak to the local identity, the, the ideology of your city. So it really comes from... So I'm going to share some ideas from around the world and take you on a bit of a journey, but it's not how you kind of replicate those models here. How does Christchurch respond to its own story of place? and really kind of, kind of speak to how you guys would recreate your city. Um, you also have a lot of different non-conventional amenities come, coming up in buildings. Maker spaces, music rooms, um, libraries, all these different ways that we can convene in a building, not just you know, hang out in our private abode, but actually connect with people in a building. So rationalize smaller private living space, but a lot richer common amenity to connect with people in a building. I love the music room idea because I've had a piano I inherited from my parents' divorce. I've carried around for about 30 years. It's been to five different apartments in New York. It's heavy as hell, too. It takes like eight people to carry it. And now it's in Balmain in Sydney. And it takes up a chunk of space. And my kids play it, so I, I've always kept it so my kids would play piano. But I wish I had a central music room and a cool complex because then I can play with other people, my kids can play with other people, and I wouldn't need that space for the piano in my home. So it's that kind of how we look at shared assets instead of privately owning everything. You're also seeing the emergence of what I call micro-neighborhoods. You know, the you know, changing nature of our living, the, the work models rapidly transforming around us. If you look at millennials that are about 2 billion strong across the world, 80% of them are freelancers. So it's radically disrupting how we think of conventional office spaces. So we're blurring the boundaries between the city itself being an office space, working from cafes, co-working studios, anywhere. Um, and a lot of the new residential models you're seeing have workspace in the building. They have recreation space, fitness, health spaces, um, all these different ways that you can kind of really give a dynamic way of living within one building. Um, what I also like about this is most of the people I engage, be they conventional market purchasers or kind of early adopters that want something different from a housing in cities, all of them kind of feel the population density that they want to be part of in a residential community is about 40 people, 30 to 40 people. Um, I don't know if that goes back to our tribal mentality of community back in the day, um, but not, they didn't, there's strong aspirations that they don't want to be one in 200 units of something where you have a lot of social isolation and lack of connectivity. City living as a shared experience. Um, I kind of I feel that here. I feel when I walk around Christchurch, there's this kind of shared experience around how you guys are doing really cool interventions in your laneways and creating really unique public realm experiences. Amazing playground, by the way. It's got to be you know award-winning playground. It's an incredible playground. Um, and it's not just housing. This is where the sharing economy and the new economic models should be embraced and enabled by civic leaders to really drive total affordability. So it's just looking across all the different touchstones of our lives that impact our monthly allowance or monthly budgets. Land I'll get into, which is really, really important. Housing models that are changing the way we live. Mobility schemes that change the way we move. Food systems and how we grow and become really food resilient and get cost-effective fresh food for everybody the changing nature of commerce, and then lifestyle choices. I'm not going to go through all these. I'm going to focus on land and housing. Um, but when I get into mobility, it's not just Uber, which is a global corporation trying to you know, mask itself from the sharing economy. Um, <laughs> it's not, I know you have a car share scheme here. What I'm getting at is membership-based car, car share, the cooperative. So the members of the car share scheme own the company and, and create dividends, so it keeps money within the community. It's how you really look at the sharing economy to create a really strong local economic resilience. So money's not just being sucked out to the global economy. It's kept here in Christchurch. Vancouver's got an incredible model called Moda. It's been around since 1997. All electric, fossil fuel free, 40,000 members contribute to that, and they all receive dividends. It's been working forever, and it's great. And it's very resilient to not relying on a global car share company. Food systems, you guys are doing amazing stuff in food. I'm excited to eat out the next couple of nights because I'm loving your restaurants as well. Um, but urban farming, edible landscapes, I know you have apps that kind of map where you have edible trees so you can go and pick fruit off trees and apples. Um, more and more of that. You also have food cooperatives. I'm a huge fan of food cooperatives. 
membership down grocery stores. My wife and I were members of a Brooklyn co-op in Park Slope. We packed, you know, boxes and shelves, you know, put, put things on shelves two hours a week, and we, for that we had probably 30% lower cost of fresh food a week, which was huge. And we felt connected to the growers around New York City. Um, you have a lot of really good food co-ops here that are good examples. You also have, in Littleton, I learned yesterday, probably one of the best world's case studies on time banking and how time banking lend itself to more resilient, dealing with the resilience after the fact of the earthquake because people were so much more connected there. People knew each other's experiences and talents and who to go to to get stuff done. Time banking is awesome. Does everyone know what time banking is? Yeah, yeah see? See, I want to sit in the audience and you guys can present to me. <laughs> um, and home exchange. I'm not staying in hotels this week. I'm staying in people's houses. Thank you to the council members who are hosting me because it's a way better experience than staying in an isolated hotel. I'm loving staying in people's homes and seeing the, you know, learning the city through the lens of them. So I'm going to get into land. The biggest problem we deal with is land. So my conundrum as a developer, because I've been so influenced by indigenous American ideology and indigenous Australian and also Maori here, I don't believe in private ownership of land. Land is a finite resource. It should not be treated as a commodity. One of the biggest issues as a species that we face is that we don't recognize that we belong to the earth. It, it, it's, it's, when we continue to look at the earth belongs to us and land is a, is a bank for us, you're going to have inequity. You're going to have environmental issues. You're going to have social justice issues. That's just how it is. Until we kind of change our paradigm of how we relate to the land, you're going to have these issues. There are transitional models that I really, really like. One is all over the U.S. and Europe right now called Community Land Trust. I believe there are certain EWEs here that use this kind of model. I'm a huge fan of them because they basically decouple land. They, they basically create a cooperative model for owning land as a shared um, a shared resource for people. There's almost 300 now in the U.S. Um, and what's great about them is they create permanent affordable housing. There are tools that cities can use to take their surplus land out of speculation. So like developers, you can't have this land. This is for the community. We have a governance structure and a trust set up. This land is for community and citizens to build affordable housing, affordable businesses forever, intergenerational. So it creates little areas, if you do this strategically, to diversify the population and the urban character of your city. Um, New York's got two of them going now. London's piloting one right now. So these are the tools that they're learning, like, wow, we better get our, you know, what together to figure out how to keep people in our city. Um, and it's really important for first home buyers that, are, you know, by the time my kids get of age, they're, they're, they're priced out of the market already. I'm priced out, and I'm a developer. I've made pretty good income in my career. Sydney's ridiculous. <laughs> um, but what I love about community land trusts also is the governance model. So this is where you get into kind of the mentality of custodianship of place. One third of the residents of the board of a land trust are made up of residents who live in that community, so they have a say in how their community grows. One third is businesses. So if you want to incubate startups, have no, no barriers, you know, create a place of possibility where people can come and create a career, invent something, do something different, do something socially just. Um, you have spaces for them to incubate at low cost level. There's no barriers. And then a third are professionals like architects, accountants, and lawyers to help deal with the more technical aspects of managing a land trust. When you buy into a land trust home, because you separate the land costs from the building costs, um, you own your unit or you can rent, it depends on which way you, what, the, what the trust wants to do, but I'll do an example of ownership. So if I went in and bought a home, I would be buying it based on my income level. So if I was a key worker making 30000 a year, I would get that unit only based on the value. I would have to spend no more than 30% of what I made individually. In return, um, when I would sell that unit, the appreciable value over time plus any investment I made to improve it, if I painted it, if I put a new roof on the unit or on the home, 25% um, of that value would come back to me. 75% would go back to the trust for reinvestment to keep land values down and maintain affordability forever. Um, but you're getting it 80% below market, so it's a pretty good deal. <laughs> we need lots more of those models. So that's kind of a foundation. And then and ground leasing as well. I don't know if there's ground leasing done a lot here, but... A lot of the developments I did in New York City were 49 and a half year, nine year, and year ground leases where I paid an annual rent on the land, which means I didn't have to spend a gajillion dollars up front. I spent 
a little bit of money every year to have the right to develop on that land and put housing on it. That enabled me to do a lot of affordable rental housing in New York. Um, now I'm going to go into housing models. So this, remember that land trust model is kind of a foundational mechanism that can kind of unlock potential for these new models that kind of come into your city. You have co-living, which I'll talk about last, which is kind of the frontier of like radical urban living that millennials are kind of driving. Co-ops, which have been around for a long time. I'm assuming there's cooperatives down here. I'm, I'm almost positive there are. Um, Nightingale housing, which is happening in Australia. Baugruppe, which is really a hot spot in Germany, in Berlin. And you have co-housing, which has been around for a number of decades. It really started in Northern Europe, but took off like wildfire in the United States. And there's a lot of demand for that here as well. I met with a couple groups here. So deliberative models are simply this. They're non-developer-led models. So these are people-led, not market-led. They're citizen-led, community-led outcomes. Um, I'm going to take you on a journey on the housing continuum now. You know, starting with, I'm not going to get into public housing, homeless shelter, special needs. All that is critical. That's really important for a city to make, you know, maintain access to housing for its most vulnerable citizens. I'm going to really get at this intermediate zone because we kind of got a lot of focus on a subsidized affordable space. There's plenty of people focusing on speculative market value housing and office space and retail. What we're missing is the forgotten ones in the middle. These are the people that are migrating out of cities that are squeezed out because they don't qualify for subsidized affordable housing and they certainly can't afford market rate housing. So there's this intermediate zone that we're missing in cities that are really critical because that's your creative class, that's your knowledge sector workers, these are your digital nomads. These are the people that are really going to create your smart city that you need to house. Your young graduates, um, downsizers, it could be, it's a whole plethora of people that fall into that zone. This is Satin Daman. It goes back to the origins of modern co-housing. So there is a group of 50 families living in Copenhagen in 1968, and there was an article in a newspaper. That newspaper, if you think about the 60s and the counterculture movement, there was this mentality of how we change the way we raise children. The article basically got a statement that every child should have 100 parents. This group of people took that literally, went out on their own blood, sweat, and tears and developed the world's you know, modern co-housing project in, in, outside of Copenhagen in Denmark called Satin Daman. And they created this really interesting model. Um, when you look at co-housing models across the world, the recipe is typically low-rise residential two, three-story units, but usually a guest room in them. You have a central courtyard, common area for recreation, barbecue, kids to play. Parking is always secondary, pushed to the side, out of the way. And then you have the central lounge room with a common kitchen, maybe a library, a recreation space, child care facility. And they're usually really sustainable. So there's usually a, a really good thermal energy or solar system to kind of drive it, urban agriculture. What's interesting about this model as we're rapidly urbanizing, when I talk about micro neighborhoods, is this model kind of compressing into a vertical multi-residential building. That's where you're starting to see the disruption of an of a urban housing model. Um, Charles Durrett, who's a good buddy of mine, and Catherine McCammett went over to visit these cool co-housing projects in Denmark in the mid-70s and came back and kind of started spruiking about it in the U.S. And it took off really well, mostly around retirees that wanted a different model for dealing with their retirement years. Not going into a conventional retirement living or aged care, but getting their friends together and aging with respect and dignity with their friends and taking care of each other. Um, so there's a lot of senior co-housing across the United States. I think there's about 300 now co-housing projects across the United States. Um, Australia's got maybe one or two. I think you guys have one or two. One? There's one completed one, but there's like three or four planned. So these are they're great models. What's awesome about co-housing, when you plop a co-housing development into a community, it activates the entire neighborhood. I spend a lot of time in co-housing projects. Kind of, I'm like a co-housing couch surfer. <laughs> Um, what I love about it is like people from the neighborhood who are coming in and out all day long. So I stay in this one called Mirandaka, which is a affordable, um, subsidized co-housing community in Victoria, Australia. Every week there's like 200 people coming in. So it's a, it's a huge activation center for what's going on around food, recreation, hanging out with the kids. Um, they just, they, they create this level of custodianship of place that's amazing. So I'm going to get into deliberative models that are citizen-led. So these are kind of non-profit break-even housing models. This is Lilac in the UK, low-impact living affordable community. 
There's a book on this. They're very transparent because they want the world to learn exactly how they did this. Forty families got together, worked with council, um, were given access to below market land in Leeds to look at a pilot co-housing urban development um, and planned it very similarly. They got raw materials. They designed it with architects, developed this central courtyard, a really good place for kids to play safely off the streets so the parents can have their eyes on the, on the kids outside. The other really important thing is we're failing kids in cities. So I think co-housing is a really interesting model when you look at the way they look at child-centric placemaking. So they design it so the psychology of the parents living in a community they aren't so stressed knowing their kids are in the central area without cars and you can see them from where you're living. Um, really, really important. Um, this is Bridge Meadows. Um, what I like about this model, not so much the architecture and the urban form, but it's the, it's the program of how they plan this one. So this is a co-housing development that was planned for seniors, age 55 plus. I think there's 30 units for age 55 plus members of the community. Um, they were given below market housing on one condition, that they became surrogate grandparents for foster children. So within the middle of the development, there's larger four or five bedroom homes for families that take in foster kids. So they get this really amazing built-in kind of intergenerational co-housing model which is becoming more and more um, mainstream in the U.S. or how you're co-locating retirees with young families with kids and having a kind of built-in daycare. Because the affordability of having someone at home to watch the kids and not to pay a gajillion dollars for your kids to go to daycare every day helps out a lot in your monthly budget. <laughs> um, and it kind of really, you know, reactivates, you know, a connection with the elderly and this kind of, what I love, this wisdom transfer. Um, it's a really, really amazing model. Now we're getting into cooperatives, which I love if you're looking at how you scale this kind of model. So this is a, a project in Zurich called the Hunziker Areal. It's a membership-driven cooperative, and the company that they created was called More Than Living. So it's meant to be an ultra-sustainable, collaborative living model pilot. And it's about 444 units, if I'm not mistaken. What's great about this, when you kind of balance this with other development happening in Zurich, when you have non-speculative development, you're not so concerned about the profit margins on your retail and your ground plane. So there's a lot of community use facilities in the ground plane, which generate a lot of community activation, public ground activation. So you don't have a lot of, expect, you can mix it up with some retail in there and coffee shops, something else, laundrette, but you have a lot of activation with community use. It might be dance theater, it might be something else, but it's for the residents. This project has an orphanage. It's got key worker housing. It's got moderate, middle income, low social housing. It's got all these different, it's got a huge spectrum of how they house people. And what's great also is there's a lot more risk aversion in doing something more creative and disruptive. So this is the kind of floor plates you're starting to see emerge around the world cities that change the way we connect with people in an apartment building. You'll notice these are smaller kind of compact living units and the floor plate, when you come out of your unit, you're not walking into a corridor to an elevator or a stair you're walking into a living room and a kitchen that you share with your neighbors on that floor. So it really creates this more resilient, socially cohesive kind of model for how we do urban housing in cities. This is Smart Urban Villages. This is a group trying to get um, a more ground lease modeled, um, citizen-led model in Australia. They are, I think, closing on their first site in Queensland very soon. Um, so they're looking at how you do, again, free up that land issue, do ground leases, and then leasehold on the units. So not, this is a non-ownership model. It's a leasehold model on the, with the housing. Again, but ultra-sustainable, food-driven, everything else, lifestyle-driven. And they have this awesome project brewing down here. Um, you guys seen this? I know some people. I know some people from Viva. <laughs> I was very fortuitous that I got to go to their networking event last night. So I actually talked about this when I was in Wellington as well. Because I re whenever I go, I research what's going on in a country. This one comes up a lot. It's like you have a group of people here that really want something like this. How do you enable it? I'm working with three groups in Australia. How do you, it's all getting the land. That's the hardest part. But once you get the land, you get the model going, it's really easy to get it going. Um, and it's amazing to see these models. I've never heard the word co-housing used so much as I had in the last few years. I've been a huge fan of that model since probably the early 2000s, but there's something happening with our changing aspirations of cities. So we'll see more and more of it coming. Now I'm going to go into architect-led models. I did share this segment of my presentation at the Architect Institute this afternoon. Um, so these are architects frustrated 
having to only work with developers and seeing the kind of housing happen in their city that have kind of taken it on themselves to look at how they can curate their own housing solution in cities. So Bow Group has been around for a long time, about four, three and a half, four decades now. Um, it's an architect-led. It can be citizen-led, but it's mainly architect-led model. They have key drivers. They want better quality housing. They want a stronger community outcome. They want stronger social connection in the building and more affordable. 10% of all new dwellings in Berlin are this model. That's pretty significant. Almost 1,000 units have been built. This is Riddestrasse 50, not huge. The other thing that you guys are super fortunate to have, you have a human scale city. I've been fighting for, I'm sitting in Sydney with these awful, god awful towers and inappropriate density all around me, and people are pissed about how their city's getting developed. You guys have this precious human scale city. Don't lose sight of that. That's why I kind of had that emotional connection as soon as I got here. I was like, wow, this place is beautiful. It's human scale. Um, and the fact that you're having a seven story limit now, keep that. Uh, it's brilliant. This is 24 units, about six stories. Um, no fences on the balcony. People can connect, liaise. It's a very collaborative living model. About 20, 30% below market. Um, really cool common amenity at the ground plane library. And this is access to the community. The community can use this facility as well. So it's not just a private uh, turning back to the community. It's opening up to the community. This is Big Yard. You heard me talk about child-centric urbanism and how we fail young families in cities. There's a lot of young families who want to be in cities now. We're not all going out to the suburbs because of the schools and everything else. I want to raise my kids in the city. Unfortunately, people don't really build urban housing for cities unless you're living in sing single-family detached homes. Um, these, this is a Zanderoth architect. They um, worked with young families in Berlin to figure out a solution that would work for the parents and the kids. Um, and they created this giant big backyard in between the buildings. So you have these townhouses on one hand, and that's the end of the apartments above, and penthouses and rooftop gardens. But you have this common amenity. Again, no fences. I don't think you guys are as fence crazy as Australians, by the way. Um, but everyone can connect. You know, the parents can cook dinner. The neighbors are out there. You can see the kids playing in the backyard. Um, it's a really great model for kids. They're not out in the streets. The parents aren't worrying about them being on the sidewalk with cars. Um, and it's a beautiful place to live. They can also scale. So this is the same architect. I know it's 150 units, but again, like five-story buildings across multiple blocks. Beautiful ground plan design. Um, beautiful interiors, but they're simple and they're affordable. These are all about 25% below what the market would be offering in Berlin. So you can scale these models pretty, pretty great. What's interesting is that the architect is changing its role in these models where they have to have really strong facilitation skills. How do you kind of manage the collective interests of 40, 50 at this point, maybe 200, 300 people? How do you do consensus-driven design? So there's these new kind of governance models of the design process when you're engaging your buyers through the planning of a building and design, but letting them kind of help drive the outcome, and you get really cool creative outcomes, which I like. Now that's how Nightingale works as well. Um, raise your hand if you heard of Nightingale Housing. It's great. You can all thank Jeremy McLeod. <laughs> Um, who's a brilliant Melbourne architect who was frustrated by the kind of commodity investor housing going up in Melbourne, sat on his own blood, sweat, and tears, and barely, barely, he, he almost went bankrupt doing the commons, which is this building right here. Um, but he did it, and he set a precedent. He put a flag on the ground, and he's like, I'm sick of it, we can do it differently. And he took leadership, bold leadership and vision, and persevered through that project, got angel investors, and did, would not take no for an answer. If you meet him, he's infectious, because <laughs> he's just, he will not stop. He's relentless. He relentlessly pursues the extraordinary. That's the term we like to use. And he got this project done. And what it did is it signaled that the market's not meeting the needs of people in Melbourne or Sydney. There's high demand for this. There's 3,800 people on a wait list to get these. There's only about 50 units getting built right now. So we have a supply-demand issue with this. But we tapped into the psyche of a lo local owner-occupier buyer that wants something different than what the market's delivering in those cities. And that's happening in every city. Common roof amenity, there's no laundries. Laundries are centralized on the roof so people can connect, do the laundry together, talk, get to know each other. Um, simple appointing of finishes in the inside. Um, 
most developers don't live in the apartment buildings they build. I brought the senior leadership team from Lemley's through this building. They would live in this building. They loved it. Concrete, wood, recycled material, recycled floors. It was authentic, and it was comforting. It was a warm environment to be in, and it wasn't driven by an estate agent. It was driven by the buyers and the architect working directly together. This was different. I felt that way in Mitchell's house last night. <laughs> it was a beautiful home to be in. Um, that's Nightingale 1. As of last Monday, people are moving into it. So the Commons was a prototype out of which the Nightingale model was born. This is um, being moved into in the next week. Uh, we just had a bank valuation done on Unit 305, and it's $95,000 above what the purchaser bought it. That's pretty significant in Melbourne. Um, so I think they're about 30% below market with that one. The purchasers are very diverse. If you go into the commons, and I've, I've been lucky to spend a couple weekends there, you have retirees in their 70s, you have two young couples with kids, you have a BMX X, X Games you know, com com competition guy, you have gamers and graphic designers. It's a really cool community. And they're really connected to each other. So when you're up on the roof, there's always people hanging out, making dinner together. There's a chalkboard in the, lo in the, lo in the um, lobby as you go out of the building, and there's always notes for people that are going hiking together. Everyone wants to connect and do stuff together. That's really great. This is how we do it. We reduce a lot of costs, what we call unnecessary costs. If we're not doing speculative development, we don't really need estate agents. We don't need marketing material. We don't need a sales office. That's about 4.5% of your development cost. That's a chunk of money, millions of dollars when you're talking about multi-residential. We try not to have basement car parking, again, leveraging the shared economy and not everyone being wedded to the private ownership of a car. We put car share embedded into the project. Outside the commons is one go-get car for 24 units. It's the most used car share car in the entire country of Australia. What they did provide is 200 bike spaces, so everyone rides bikes in that building. Um, that's the kind of, kind of behavioral thing we can shift if we don't overload and make it easy for people to have cars. You know, you're, you know you're doing good as a city if you don't want to own a car. I did not want to own a car in New York City. It sucks to own a car in New York City. Plus it costs like owning a second apartment to park it. Um, no individual laundries. So when we engage the buyer cohort, so far we have 100% of people who don't want a second bathroom or an ensuite bath. They're fine with having a larger central bathroom for everyone to share. 100% um, of people don't want private laundry. They're totally cool with taking that out and getting more livable area in their building. Um, and then we don't do individual services because it's, we, we're focusing heavily on being carbon neutral and being super sustainable. We tend to centralize our thermal energy system and make it really easy to maintain and keep it off the grid pretty much with solar. Why are architects choosing this model? Creativity. How do you unleash the full creative potential and vision of the architect? How do you shape your city identity through design? How do you create that emotional connection and fall in love with the place? When I go around certain cities in the world, I fall in love. Like, I fall in love. You, you guys have an appreciation for design, and I can see it. Um, but we need more of that. If, there's, if, if profit is taken out of that equation, it unleashes the power of creativity to be something very different. And if you're working directly with a group of local citizen and owner-occupiers who want to live in that place, it can really yield some really interesting local place-based outcomes on design. Now, there are developers out there doing some really cool stuff. And I don't bag developers. I am a developer. And there are some really amazing developers doing incredibly developer-led affordable models. One of those is a guy named Mark Vlessing in London. Um, he does pocket living. So he was fed up by this exodus happening in his city. He wanted to figure out how he could create a model for key workers, the city makers, he calls them, which are the musicians, nurses, teachers, bus drivers, whoever it may be, that give the kind of the function, that make a city function. And he, through blood, sweat, and tears, like Jeremy, bold leadership, unrelenting engagement and perseverance, engaged the banking institutions, engaged planning authorities, engaged communities, and figured out how to do pocket living. So he's gotten the financing figured out, he's gotten land acquisitions figured out, he does crowdsource financing to raise money to buy land, he did a really good design, so he does compact homes of 36 to 38 square meters, very well appointed with storage, quality design. Um, you can only make up to 70,000 pounds a year to qualify to buy into it. They're also 20% below market, not subsidized at all. 
Um, and there's a covenant on sale. It's the same thing with Nightingale. When you buy a unit 20% below market, either in this model or Nightingale, you cannot resell that unit to market value for 20-something years. So if you do sell it within 5 or 10 years, you're selling it indexed to market at the same percentage you bought below it, so you're passing that saving on to the next buyer. You can't just go in there and make a killing after you bought it. Um, that would be really bad. We'd be failing on our mission. <laughs> Um, and that, they use crowd cu crowd cube. So a lot of you know the democratization of real estate financing. I know there's some challenges getting banks lending on projects here. You need to figure out how do you get everyone to kind of create your own local bank. Um, I got really involved with crowdsource financing in Seattle with Fundrise, um, which really signaled the democratization of property investment. It wasn't only in the hands of institutional investors. It can be in the hands of everyday people in their community. Um, the story of Fundrise is brilliant because it was the sons of a property developer in D.C. They saw this really cool heritage building in a more blighted area, and they saw this potential for this building to be something different, to be kind of what a gap filler might do in a city, which is like you know create a really creative environment, mix of uses, a barber shop, a barber, um, I mean a, a bar and a barber shop, um, a hair salon. I think they had a co-working space and some living units. So it was a very dynamic model for the building. Banks wouldn't lend that at all. So what they did is they went to their, their father's attorney, figured out a loophole in the Securities and Exchange Commission legislation on investing, and created the first crowdsourcing platform for property. They had no idea what was, what was going to happen. They put it out there online, and within three days they raised half a million dollars from the block they were going to build it on. So people on the block could put $200 in, $50, $1,000, whatever they wanted. But people on, in that community invested in their own place. So this is a really unique model. Um, that's Mark right there. Google him. Watch his YouTube. He's very inspiring. Co-living is where we get into the more radical forms of living. Um, this is really about that experiential-led generation. These are people that don't necessarily want to own an asset like their parents do. They don't want to be tied down by a mortgage. These are for the freelance global nomads that want to travel around the world and experience life, you know, be connoisseurs of urban experiences and just travel and really get the most out of the world. Um, they're very lifestyle driven. The, the jury's out on where this falls in the spectrum. Um, I wouldn't say it's quite affordable. I wouldn't say it's definitely not market rate. Um, they're membership driven models. So it's more like a bill to rent, but you don't have a one or two year lease. You pay a monthly membership fee one bill a month for everything. Utilities, if you, or you use your app, it's a very curated environment, so you have an app that kind of connects you into your city and cultural attributes of your city, how to meet people, how to get a workspace, do you want your room clean, do you want to order some food, do you want dry cleaning, you can order it all on an app and you get one bill a month based on how you use it, so it simplifies it. You walk into one of these units, they're furnished, they have utensils, you just go in with your suitcase, super easy. Um, this is the largest one to date right now in London. It's an old office building that converted to a co-living model. Again, disruptive floor plates. So you have a lot of small, well-appointed units, but you don't just go into a conventional corridor and just walk down a long corridor to an elevator. You have game rooms, lounges, cafeterias, reading rooms, co-working spaces, well-appointed rooms. And this is the laundry center, cafe, game room, library to hang out with your friends. Totally different. It's a total lifestyle change of a building. We Live is coming to a city near you, I bet, in the next few years. <laughs> um, I'm not a huge fan of WeWork either because, again, they're a big global corporation, but they have tapped into that disruptive office space. So they're almost $20 billion, you said, Steve, right? Market cap, $20 billion market cap. WeWork's in like every major city in the world right now. They've caught on, oh, this, work, this workspace thing is really cool. We're making a lot of money. But we can do this in housing, too. So they piloted We Live, which is kind of the same concept of collaborative living, in Navy Yards in Brooklyn. So they worked with New York City planning and did this really inventive housing model, very similar to the collective in the UK. The difference with these guys, unlike the collective, which is kind of a one-off, these guys can grow and scale this globally in every city. So imagine you had a membership to We Live and you're a freelance photographer, you can have a place to stay in Sydney, a place to stay in Berlin, a place to stay in London, a place to stay in New York. It changes the dynamics of how we think about stability and housing. This is why these people don't want to own, be 
bogged down by a mortgage. They can kind of turn off their membership one month and take off to another place. Same kind of models, the collective, central laundries, cafeterias, game rooms, lounges, very curated, lifestyle-driven housing model. This is a bit of a difference on that. This is Zoku living, and for the designers out there, I think this is the most cool, you know, best designed model. Um, it's more of a hotel, so it's temporary stay. So if you might be doing uh, a freelance job in another city, this is Amsterdam, I could stay here for a month or two months and pay this a low rate, a lot cheaper than I would if I did Airbnb or a hotel. Really cool design, so it's a micro unit, but it's got really smart furniture solutions, so the stairs push away, open up that wall, it's a little sleeping loft up there, so you don't need a lot of space, but really, really great storage. Beautiful lounge areas, kitchen areas, um, botanic gardens to work in, rooftop lounges. So those are the housing models. But it's, we also have to support the cultural creatives and the cultural arts precincts of cities. This is Portland. Um, Portland does some really cool stuff. Portland doesn't aspire to be a global city. They do smart things. They have disruptive infrastructure. You could consider them a smart city. They have innovation district galore. They don't talk about that stuff. All they care about is being the funkiest, weird Portland possible. And that creates a center of gravity for people to want to be there. They're not out there beating their chest that they want to be a global city. They just, they recognize that to be globally recognized, you have to be hyper-local. You have to be unique. You have to be different than everybody else and create a unique urban experience that people are going to want to be drawn to. They're a tiny little city. They're probably the same population as here, actually. And I love that. What's that? Same as Auckland. Same as Auckland. Yeah. Um, and I love that Seattle's a sister city, by the way. I totally forgot about that. Um, but this is city repair project. This is intersections project. So every quarter or so, all the residents in the neighborhoods around Portland take over the intersection in their neighborhoods, and they do a mural with the kids and invent something, and cars can't go through it. So they create a public, public space for themselves. It's one little tiny intervention. You guys are doing amazing stuff around that already, so you tick, tick, tick. This is Holtz Market in Berlin. This is an entire precinct on the waterfront of Berlin that's not being driven by developers or the city. It's being driven by artists and nightclub owners. So the city worked to find a sovereign wealth fund in Switzerland to purchase the land and give the land control to the artists and the nightclub owners. The only rule is you can't make profit in this district. So think about the creativity and the people that attract to Berlin. Berlin gets how they attract talent to the city. They keep it real, they keep it funky, they make no barriers for creatives to come there and do something, and artists to do something. So watch this city, watch this little space grow over the next decade. So it's fairly, I think it's only a couple of years old now. Um, but if you're ever in Berlin, it's a great place to go visit. And people who have been there said it's an amazing place to go see things. Kind of like Christiania is if you've been to Copenhagen. Um, there's that really amazing space in the old army barracks. And then in Melbourne, and I wish Sydney would pay more attention to Melbourne. <laughs> There's a lot of cultural creatives. I belong in Melbourne, but I can't deal with the weather, so I stay in Sydney. But I visit Melbourne like twice a month, so it's great. Melbourne gets this stuff. So the state government gave these hulking three buildings over to a nonprofit for free. They get they have to enable this stuff. or They, they, they get how vital their creative class is to their city. Um, to keep it diverse, to keep it eclectic, to keep it weird, to keep those street murals going. You guys have beautiful street murals, by the way. Um, so Marcus Westbury, I don't know if you've ever heard of Renew Newcastle. He's in charge of this. So he reinvented kind of the kind of citizen-led makerspace retail that really reinvented Newcastle. And now he's kind of working to help populate a space that's low cost or no cost for performance artists graphic artists, painters, you name it, to come and have a place. So Collingwood welcomes them, and it's going to change that whole district. Um, we need lots and lots of that in cities right now. Um, I think I've covered everything. Um, we can go to Q&A, but I just want you guys to know how much I love your city, and you have such amazing things happening. Um, what's, where the real innovation comes from is through the power of limits. When you come from nothing, the imagination and how you guys are you know, doing those interventions in little spaces, they mean so much. All these great cities you hear about in the world are trying so hard to do what you guys are doing on the ground here. So how you keep that 
Um, so it's not always focusing on highest and best use, but it's how you think about how you embrace highest and precious use, highest and critical use, so you don't lose sight of how you're building the cities for everybody. That's it. Thank you, guys. You can help. I'll, I'll help you. We're going to get some water, lovely. Well, thank you, Jason. That was um, a very detailed um, look around the world. I'm actually I'm in awe at how much stuff is going on around the world. It's, it's quite incredible. Um, we've got half an hour for a Q&A. We'll be taking some questions from the live stream um, at the back and, and the floor as well, and there's some roving mics. I'm going to start off with a, a very quick one related to Christchurch. So you've had a look around. You've had a look at the East Frame. You've had a look at the residential red zone. Uh, we have a lot of great ideas like this. Um, we have, obviously, the Viva project. Uh, we've got Wiki House. We've got different development like Ohu. People want to do this stuff, and it hasn't happened. So what advice do you have in terms of dealing with um, different players where you have maybe central government owns the land, the local government owns some land or has access to land, um, you've got down here, you've got incredible projects and ideas that are ready to go, there's bits missing. I mean, so in your short stay here, looking back at some of these projects and how they've actually happened, what advice do you have for us here in Christchurch? It's the, getting the land. Um, so I think governments have the potential to create patient capital outcomes. So on land, it's unique. A lot of cities sold off their land. New York would sell off land for a dollar to do affordable housing, but they now regret that they've sold all that and not leased it. So they have maintain control and kind of can curate those properties over time. Um, what I advise the governments in Australia, and we're doing urban regeneration very poorly there, we're kind of stuck because the speed of capital and the way that Treasury wants to see a return come back to the state is not very different than what a developer wants to see a return come back to the state. So we're losing that kind of long-term vision and impact. So when you want that speedy return and high rate of return for capital, you create really perverse outcomes because you're kind of pushing the private sector to go only to luxury housing and really dense luxury housing to pay for that. Um, so we have a lot of sticks out there, meaning we want the affordable housing, we want sustainability, we want infrastructure solutions, we want creative spaces. But in order to do that, you need to unlock the patient capital solution to do that. So the private sector will do all that, but in order to help them pay for it and meet their high profit margins, you're going to get really inappropriate density. Mm. So we're stuck on a lot of the urban regen projects in Australia because they're going too big too fast. Um, another major thing I didn't mention is this concept of solastalgia. When you go really big, really fast, and you rapidly change your environment, you cause this, it's almost, it's a, there's a philosopher named Glenn Albrecht in the early 90s coined this term to denote a feeling of homesickness, even though you haven't left your home because your environment's changed so rapidly around you. I would surmise a lot of Christ church people feel that because your environment changed rapidly, dramatically around you. Um, and it's growing in a different direction, but probably in a really good direction, I feel, as, as I walk around the city here. Um, so the speed of which we're doing our regeneration, mm -hmm. but getting the land component and tempering land value inflation, those are the tools that cities need to do. Councils can partner with these community groups and figure out a way to make an economic return over time but help curate an outcome that people can point to, that citizen-led, you know, really speaks to the Christchurch mentality of how they want to live in the city center, um, and unlock that potential. I mean, once you have that one, like that Commons project in Melbourne where people can point to, it unlocks. You know, it says you can do that. Yeah. You know, here's permission to do that. We want to enable that. Yeah. And councils are seeing the benefit to the diversity happening in their community. So the Brunswick community, that council is loving it. Because all this income and economic development is happening in their community mm. now because of that. Well, so, I mean, it's, it's, it's useful you say that because we actually did have a project here. We, we ran a competition called the Breathe Project. Yes. And that was all ready to go. And the only reason it didn't happen was because the government wanted too much money for the land. It's so, happening so, everywhere. So <laughs> you don't, we don't want to repeat that again. No. Okay. Questions from the floor. Over there. David. Do we have a mic? Yeah.
We'll, we'll need a mic runner. Um, hi, my name's David. Um, have you got any examples where you have an old community which is uh, tied based on an industrial gridiron um, street system where the community of maybe 50 people have decided actually we don't want to live behind fences and our roads are tied, um, where they possibly create, not moving out of their houses, but create a new community outcome by taking down fences um, and reviving that space and maybe building a new little community center, uh, community building in the middle. Have you got any examples that have always happened around the world where you don't have to go to greenfields or... Yeah, you retrofit uh, uh, suburbia. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, there's a, there's, a, there's a whole thing called greening the gray fields right now um, happening in Australia and it happened a lot in the U.S. with the new urbanist movement, which is retrofitting suburbia to make a more community-connected place. I don't know specific examples where fences were taken down, um, but when, when you're talking, I immediately think of Savannah's grid. Do you know Savannah, Georgia? Savannah has this incredibly beautiful grid where there's this kind of like square parks and houses surround them, so there's just stairs and porches. Everything's open, so everything's kind of facing this green park um, where everyone can connect, know their neighbor, say hi, you know, wave across the street, have a beautiful green space. I don't know the structure of your grid, if that's even possible. Um, but you don't have to look anywhere else. If you, you know, that's the beauty of, like, do what you feel is right for your place. Um, and if you, you, if you have consensus with your neighbors, just go do it. Ask for permission if it has to go through codes and everything, but um, it seems like a really interesting idea for your neighborhood right now. Okay, anyone else? Here. Hey, so my, my background is in choreographing landscapes. And what I want to ask you, Jason, is how, do, how does urban planning mimic this? Because my... In, in essentially landscape design and uh, agroforestry and so on, we have these patterns that sort of kind of time and time again, like the best ways to serve, uh, to serve restoration of the ecosystem around it is by kind of choreographing a few central elements, be it, um, be it contouring the landscape or the, uh, the species that you're adding in and so on. Um, do you find there are some of these surefire patterns that come up in urban planning or does it depend particularly on the ecosystem it's housed in? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of both. I mean, you have to respond to the land. So I teach regenerative design and development. So the living building challenge, I think you guys know about that. I, I think there's a few living buildings going on down here. You know, the way I was taught to do really deep transformational sustainable development models is working with what's working for life in that place now. What are the ecosystem services? What's the ecological value? And how do you build off that and not deteriorate that but enhance it? Um, so there's a different way of approaching how you look at improving a city landscape. Um, how do you bring ecosystem services back in the urban core? Um, we drove by the poo ponds yesterday. <laughs> so you guys are doing really good stuff, ecological treatment of water. I saw the pumps today at the river. So there's, you know, how do you start to bring natural capital into the urban core. That's one issue of how you have to deal with the land and design with the land, not against it. Um, when you add the human element into that, the patterns that are out there, where there's ancient patterns in our life, this gets into like biophilic design and biophilic city making. Our brains are pre-wired to respond favorably to certain types of urban form and urban patterns around scale, which is why when I come here, I have this really immediate kind of relaxing feeling because I'm not sitting in these towers and canyons and streets. You have this human-scale landscape. Um, bilateral symmetry in architecture. The grid, the view corridors, refuge, having, you know, wall, your ground plane design, all that triggers certain responses to a more favorable urban experience when you, from a human neurological standpoint. So you're just starting to see this very interesting emerging field of neuroscience and design um, and I'm doing some of that at UTS with some colleagues over from Amsterdam that are studying the cognitive impacts of cities. New York has some really interesting um, stuff going on with the ecologies of addiction and how certain urban patterns trigger addictions around smoking and drinking. 
So it's a really nascent space, but we need to be better at how we design cities that respond to our neurological function. So it's kind of balancing the human dimensions and the ecological dimensions. So you, and let those things drive. You get a really amazing 21st century regenerative city model. That I think that's where we're going to in cities right now. We're learning so much from science, like science-led urban planning. CSIRO in Australia is doing some really incredible stuff on that. This is the common, Commonwealth Science Arm. So have you been down to the East Frame to have a look? I have. We've got this kind of 600-meter yep. landing strip where everything's been cleared yes. and huge amounts of grey paving. I mean, yep. how should we approach that so that we don't end up with just great big blocks of towers everywhere? Uh, okay, so, well, that's where you get into your ground plane design. Um, so, like, I see, I mean, I walked that strip. That's where you made the sidewalk really big, and there's, bi <laughs> there's bike lanes on the sidewalk. Yeah. You have to deal with yeah. that when you yeah. start getting those buildings in there. <laughs> They'll get dangerous quickly. Um, but how do you activate that ground plane? So there, there's lessons learned from where you're doing those big kind of urban regen projects. At Lemlease, we largely failed at Victoria Harbor, and Steve knows that well. We used to work together there. Because we sold off all the ground plane for commercial strata use, and we didn't really think about how to curate it and make sure there was a local response to placemaking, activation. So there's a lot of empty building, empty ground plane buildings, mm -hmm. and didn't really create the place. So we had a lot of negative aspects coming to it just about that. So not allowing, I would imagine that street as I'm walking down it, there's not a lot of brakes for car parking, so the car parking should happen on the other side. A lot of street activation and parklets like you're doing on Wall Street, so you have places to sit outside under the tree canopy. Um, safe refuge under rain and weather, so you have canopies coming out that are kind of uniform and scaled and symmetrical as you walk down that street. Look, it becomes a boulevard. Mm. Um, but it could be, you know, a, what I love is like how do you activate the ground? If you're doing these kind of different housing models, put the laundromat on the ground plan with a bar next to it. And you can have Sounds a beer while you're yeah. doing your laundry. It's like you can change, you know, you kind of curate a different yeah. environment on the ground plane, but how do you activate it not only with retail, but places make it sticky so people mm -hmm. can stay there and have a drink, talk, intermingle. Um, so be really creative. I would get, get Fuller's advice, I would get Rachel's advice yeah. on that. How do you really <laughs> create places to sit and, yeah. and ponder and talk? Mm. Okay, any questions? Emma, someone from the live stream. I know Barnaby's out there. Barnaby. Yeah. It's, actually, it's actually not from Barnaby. Everybody. This one. <laughs> so he is watching. Um, could you speak to the legal and financial structures that support these kinds of projects, and how are they the same, and how are they different from standard property development? Yes. So, great question. I, I kind of took those out slides out because I thought they might be too technical, but we, we thought there would be a question on that. Um, so it depends on the rules of investing and where you are. So not... Berlin has a little less friction on the purchasers putting their own money in. So they'll take their equity, put it into an investment holding company. If it's not enough to do the building, they might top it up with third-party equity, maybe get a subsidy from the council they're planning on, on housing affordability, and then they'll do conventional construction financing um, for about 70% of it. So 30% would be equity, 70% finance. not too dramatic than a different uh, conventional development. In Australia, we have different investment rules on ASIC. So Nightingale kind of fits within what we can do. So the way we raise money very organically, so say a Melbourne project would start, the architect and the development service provider would get a group of people in a room just like this, present the aspirations of vision for a project, and raise third-party equity. So they'd raise $100,000 from 25 people to get $2.5 million dollars to go purchase a site and get planning documentation put together. And then you just go get construction financing. So we have we cap profit at 15% with Nightingale. So we have a limited profit model, which is about as low as you can go and still get construction financing. So the lender has comfort. There's a gap. There's a buffer there. Um, we're working very closely with the banking community on how we change the loan to cost model. Because we're non-speculative, there's a different risk profile. That's the beauty of it. There's a little less planning risk if I can go into a planning meeting with council and have 40 purchasers that are voters saying this is, what, this is exactly what they want. You know, yes, we're meeting on all the codes and everything, but I have the planning, I have the group with me here. Um, on the buyer side lending, 
a lot of the banks are coming to the table looking at this model as an owner-occupied model and freeing up, letting them do 5% down payment, which in Australia with the, with the stamp duty and everything else is a huge difference. Um, so every step of the way on Nightingale, we're looking at, particularly the capital markets and the financing space, to enable us to achieve lower price. And because we're transparent, the other beautiful thing is we're 100% transparent. So not only do the planners, the banks, the purchasers, everyone sees the financial model 100%, every penny, how it's spent. And when you're going through the decision-making process with the buyer, they can see how their decisions for not having a second bathroom, centralized laundry impacts the cost of their unit, and also decisions on services impact the cost of living in that unit over time. Um, and because of all that, we're putting that system together with the banks. The banks are starting to see a very different risk profile of us. But it's not very dissimilar to a conventional development financing model. We're just looking at even a 5% difference in loan to cost is a huge impact. If I can borrow money from the bank at 4.5%, and not 15% equity, that's a big difference in how I can push that savings down to the buyer. Um, it's different in, in different areas. There's a lot of crowdsourced equity financing in the US, um, where a developer will go out online, launch their project, and raise three or four million dollars from anyone. Um, that model's not quite unlocked in Australia yet. I'm not sure, I'm sure you have crowdsourced finance, maybe not for property here yet, um, but it, that's another mechanism to unlock mm. in kind of democracy, so you can scale how you raise money. For Nightingale, we're also, keep it secret. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's not. I know it's not going to be secret, <laughs> I'm making a joke. <laughs> we're looking at creating an ethical property fund, because we're seeing, because of the different risk profile, and it's still a pretty rational return, 50% is actually really good, than where else, you, where other places you can put your money. There's a lot of ethical investors out there that see that as a safe place to put their money. So we have a lot of repeat third-party investors that want to continue investing in Nightingale. So we're looking at raising a $100 million ethical property fund to support projects nationally in Australia. That's great. There's actually an ethical property company in the UK. I'm working with them in good, Australia. Good. Yeah. Um, and Pledge Me has looked at that model here, yeah, mixing great. equity and debt funding. At the back there, is that you, Margaret? Yes. See you. There's a couple of um, little examples I don't know whether you're aware of which follows on from your um, answer to that question. One, I was in Colville and Coromandel recently, small town. They've got a co-op ageing um, yeah, co building there and that land has been bought by the local op shop. So it's a local op shop that's bought the land. and that, So looking at things small. The other example that I'm talking about is, again, is in Littleton. Um, we... Um, save collectively. So we have groups saving collectively. So there's four people that have finished their mortgages interest-free. So there's lots of little models around there, not necessarily those ones that are scaling. Thanks. Mm, thank you. Any other questions? Down here at the front. Uh, kia ora, Jason. I'm Sophie Allen, and I'm working to try and get an environment centre back in Christchurch, a, co a community-led, uh, community-owned asset. And I was, you've touched quite a lot on uh, co-housing, but I was wondering if you know any models that incorporate community-owned assets within housing models, for example, and if that has been able to subsidise a community-owned space. Community-owned assets within the co-housing development. Yeah. You, did talk, you mentioned some of the residence share spaces, but uh, it's something where the outside community can also be involved. Um, I, I'm not sure if I know a model like that. Is um, that possibly because it's not a commercial? Is that um, you can't offset the, uh, the space would be also uh, had to be affordable for the community? Yeah, well, I would think cooperatives would have a lot of that. Um, the other thing that was one thing we're looking at with Nightingale is how, if, if it's viable on the ground plane to have commercial strata. The Commons vision was to sell one unit and then the strata keeps the other unit, so the revenue generated from the retail offsets common maintenance. Um, there is probably a model for how the community can co-invest in something like that around a community space um, and make it an income generating thing for the community. That's where I would see like food cooperatives being a really strong community asset and a, and a, and a place driver. Um, I, don't, I can't think of any offhand right away that there would be a central community asset within a development like that. 
So it could be a first in Christchurch. Okay. That's what I mean, you guys. Like, <laughs> don't worry about like set Urban your farming. own precedent. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, it's that's the beauty when you when you start taking this kind of bold leadership. Like South Lake Union, we became an innovation district, right? The Brookings Institution called it that. We never strove to create an innovation district. What we strove for is to be as sustainable as possible, create a really good place, good architecture. Um, and rule number one, no franchise retail. It all had to be local retail. So you had a unique place to come to. It just happens that Google, Amazon, Microsoft, Facebook like those kind of places. <laughs> so they became the innovation innovators. <laughs> Um, but it enabled us, you know, there's a, l a lot of collaborative governance. So we worked directly with council, directly with the utilities, directly with the planning authorities, and created a really strong enabling governance so that we as a private sector developer felt safe investing in the never-been-done-before models and setting precedences. And that led to all these companies like, this is a place of possibility. We can do things in this, in this city. And that was, it was an economic development strategy for the mayor. I mean, it was just like, wow. <laughs> Um, and I feel that, I feel when I come here, this is a place of possibility. I can come and reinvent myself here. I can come and do something different. And it's like, it's, it's great. You're in a really unique advantage point right now as a city. Lynn. Hi. Thank you very much. I was wondering whether you had any advice um, coming back to the idea of patient capital. Yes. And the potential for, for instance, the city council to either the own, land it only currently owns or that um, the government sees wisdom and passes some of the land that it owns to the council and the possibility of it then um, either through the leasing option of land to developments that they don't end up owning the land. So the one challenge there is how do you wean people off the idea that you have to own your house? So that's one obstacle that that would present. And the other possible obstacle might be to sit city ratepayers not thinking the council should spend its money that way of letting people have land without getting commercial return for it. What arguments do you present to the ratepayers to allow the council to do these sort of innovative um, opportunities of making land available in various ways? Oh, it's a tricky question. <laughs> <laughs> Well, raise your hand if you're willing not to have to own land, but have a really cool community. Let's see if, okay. So there you have go. You got your first community. There Ready you go. To go. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the, one of the models I share a lot about is Battery Park City in New York, where the state government mm. came together with the local council in Manhattan, and the Empire State Development Corporation partnered with the Battery Park City Authority. So this is land on the southern tip of Manhattan that was created by the excavation of the World Trade Centers. So if you look at historic maps of the city before the World Trade Centers, the southern tip fattened out towards the Hudson River. That became Battery Park City. They didn't sell any of that land. It started in the 70s and slowly evolved under you know, the Rockefeller vision back then um, as a really amazing place for affordability and sustainability because they ground leased it. They didn't do it all to one developer. So they broke it up into chunks. They created the first high-performance building district in the United States, so the very first LEED-certified building, Battery Park City. So if you're going to come play in that piece of land as a developer, you had to go by the city's rules on sustainability and affordability and livability and quality of architecture. Um, and, it, and it created this amazing place over time um, that now I think they get about $15 million a year of revenue from ground rent that all gets reinvested into a central affordable housing fund to continually be able to reinvest in affordable housing. Um, so it's a long-term view. It's a, it's a leadership decision. It's saying, we're going to do something different in our city. We're not going to sell our land. We're going to enable some kind of innovation in housing to you know, bring back people to our city center, generate an economic return that is you know, being financially res fisc you know, fiscally responsible with taxpayer money, but showing that that return can get reinvested back as community benefit. So it's, it's that paradigm shift from how you generate community wealth. It's not just individual wealth all the time. That's what creates really perverse outcome. But how do you generate community wealth over time? Um, and staying with the land as a, as a civic leadership institution like really can generate and curate the kind of city that you, know, you have all the visionary people on your team. I've met, you have a really amazing staff. 
um, brilliant people that understand cities. It's just unlocking them and being able to help curate that outcome. But, you know, I think you'd have to create a really strong partnership with the national government here. Um, yes. Work with them. Yes. I know, I know, I know you can giggle <laughs> at it. <laughs> it's, a, it's a Labour government. Anyway, um, <laughs> well, over there. <laughs> yeah, no, just... Yes, so yes, you have this new horizon in front of you now. So, you know, these are the kind of things you yes. can think about now and engage that discussion. Good time to come, actually. Just yeah. a question back there. Just think, maybe you sort of... I've been just thinking about uh, that last question just as you're answering it. You mentioned in the presentation about one community that crowdsourced and a significant proportion of it came from people on the block. Yes. So it's as almost as if, you know, that micro community within the broader city could say, yes, I want this in my backyard. Yes. As part of the answer to sort of, you know, taking the leap and saying, yeah, we're going to try something different with this land ownership model, you know, the, the government or the council is going to you know, fund this stuff, you know, does the city want to say, yes, we want to see this stuff in our backyard, you know, as, you know, most developments going up, it's just, no, 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 we don't want to see it in our backyard. You know, what's the... You know, How do you deal with nimbyism? Yeah, yeah. How do you turn that into nimbyism? Yeah. You know? um, so it's, it's interesting. Richard Florida calls them the new urban Luddites. He's changed the terminology of nimbyism. So nimbyism was, was needed when heavy industry was coming in the neighborhood and you had to fight, you know, environmental pollution and pollution of waterways. That was good nimbyism. Nimbyism to protect your little nest egg and your wealth and preventing other people from having the same benefits you got when you bought your property, bad nimbyism. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, that's what I mean about equity and inclusion. We all play a role in it. You know, and it, I, I would imagine it's the same in Australia as it is. You, you, everyone's kind of got a piece of the pie. So I'm dealing with a lot of landowners that want to do nightingales, but they're as tied into the system as any, everyone else. So they're all protecting their wealth, and they should. I mean, it's, it's everyone's right to do that. Um, there are now laws passed in California that shut nimbyism down because they're seeing how detrimental nimbyism is to the evolution of a city's growth and a, and a sustainable growth. Um, the loud voices are being quieted down in London, in New York, California passed laws. You can't even go to a council meeting to reject a planning approval. If it's going through all the tick, tick the boxes thing, they don't even have a voice anymore because they see how detrimental it is to the sustainable, affordable growth of California cities. Um, so that's one avenue that people are taking is taking legal against, against that. What I, now, the more organic way of dealing with them Nightingale, as an example. We go through planning approval. Developers don't like that we don't have to do parking because they, they want to keep the same thing. They want to keep their marketability of parking units. So a couple of developers and some NIMBYism has put negative comments into block developments. So Nightingale 2 had about three or four really negative NIMBY you know, letters submitted to council. They were drowned out by about 500 letters that were submitted for support from all over the country. So because we're a coalition trying to change how we look at housing, I wrote a letter to council. My neighbors in the city wrote a letter to council. Everyone in the community is supporting Nightingale. They, the council got drowned out by letters of support. They've never experienced that before. Pro-development in their neighborhood. Because it's doing the right thing, because it's engaging the community, because it's driving better architecture, because it's more community and affordable focused, um, there's a lot of support for it. I had this really unique... Um, project I was working on for Lendlease, and because it was a deliberative development model, I had the future residents sitting with me in this community engagement workshop with the site neighbors. So it wasn't me doing risk mitigation and keeping the neighborhood happy. It was the future residents telling the kind of vision they had for the site and how they wanted to live next to those neighbors. I just sat back and listened to these guys talk, right? And they reconciled what they each wanted from the development site which lucky is exactly what I wanted to do <laughs> around density and the kind of housing we put in, but it changes the nature of engagement with the neighborhood if you have future residents talking directly with the existing neighborhood yeah. residents. Yeah. And we need I mean, more of that dialogue. Totally, the deliberative yes. development. I mean, that's a, a great place um, to leave it, folks. Um, I, just uh, want to I think Mrs. Quigley wanted to ask a question. Ooh, <laughs> do we have time, Instead? Jessica? I think we're pretty much... Uh, if you're very quick, Jane. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, there's a lot of pressure on then. <laughs> um, Jason, thank you <laughs> very much answer. for your acknowledgement. 
of the Viva project. It's great having you at our networking meeting last night. And um, I'm very excited about what you talk about with the Nightingale model, and it would be so wonderful to have it here in Christchurch. Um, we talked about the lease options. You're really keen on leasing of the land and the community land trusts. And Lynn talked about, you know, whether we'd like to, whether we could give up ownership. My understanding is that the land could be leased, but the home could still be owned. That's correct. Yeah. And so how is it with the Nightingale model? It seems like there's been something, and you might have said this, so forgive me if I didn't get it, that... Um, it seems to be an innovative way to work with something that's already there and in that people can still own their own homes in a, um, but in a more affordable way. Correct. And so is there, is there some aspect of social housing involved in that and um, an, an opportunity for people to rent? And, and into the future, is, um, is there a new model being looked at? That wasn't a yeah. great question, Jack. Um, it's, well, you, it's you a got two minutes, one. Jason. I could do two minutes. So no, it's not social housing. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's intentionally filling that kind of gap in the middle between social and market rates. So this intermediate housing, owner-occupied only. You cannot be an investor in a Nightingale project. But I am working with a group called Common Equity New South Wales that is subsidized affordable cooperative housing. Um, so we're looking at a hybrid where we have rental affordable subsidized units for one-third and two-thirds Nightingale so you can cross-subsidize it. There are models like that around the world. We're looking at how do we scale that so we can actually really get a lot of diversity and more key worker housing in the urban center. So yes, the, there are. you can do anything if you have the will and leadership to do it. Good. Great answer, Jason. <laughs> um, so, and Jessica, you're going to finish up? On behalf yeah, of us? I'm just going to hold the mic now. Okay, um, good for you. Go thank you. <laughs> uh, as it says on the screen, uh, ko Jessica Halliday toko ingoa, uh, ko aho te kai whakahaere o te pūtahi, Christchurch Centre for Architecture and City Making. So clearly this concludes tonight's Christchurch Conversation event. And I would like to express my great thanks to Jason for agreeing to come to Ōtatahi Christchurch to give this very stimulating and timely lecture. Yeah. And thank you, Councillor Raff, Manji, Thanks, for man. facilitating yeah, tonight's Q&A. Yeah. Um, and thank you, everyone, for coming, uh, because, of course, we put these events on specifically so you will come. So thanks for such a great turnout. And thanks to our online audience um, watching the live stream. Um, We're delighted you could join us tonight. So I hope you are going to leave here feeling excited and determined to see Christchurch adopt these sorts of innovative and affordable models of residential living and development. As New Zealanders, we often talk about ourselves as having the do-it-yourself ethos as part of who we are. And certainly we have Indigenous and other local traditions to draw on as we adopt and adapt the sort of living and development in this place. To remind you, tonight's lecture has been recorded. So part of this adoption and adaption is creating a movement. And we have the core of the movement here. Um, we know that. But please share the video when it comes out. Um, it's going to come out on the Teputahi website and on YouTube. Um, and watch our Facebook page for the release of that video. And make sure you share it with others, with your friends and communities, to help generate that momentum and desire for these models here. I'd like to thank the Christchurch City Council um, for initiating and presenting the Christchurch Conversations Programme. Uh, Te Pūtahi is delighted to be working with Council in the development and delivery of this programme. I'd like to acknowledge the support of our event partners for Jason's visit and presentation tonight, uh, Regenerate Christchurch and the Canterbury branch of the New Zealand Institute of Architects. And thank you also to the team from Council and Te Putahi um, who've worked to realise tonight's event. Now, we do hold more Christchurch conversations. And if you want to know um, about them in the future, you can sign up to our mailing list. Um, there's an iPad there. You can sign up tonight, or you can sign up via the link on our Facebook page. Um, but tonight, it's a pleasure to announce the next Christchurch Conversation event. So please mark your diaries. In collaboration with Nga Oho and Nga Tokori Forum, the next Christchurch Conversation will be a panel discussion on Indigenous design and architecture to be held on the 1st of March 2018 at the piano. 
So we look forward to seeing you all then. And to close off, I'd like to invite you all again to acknowledge and thank Jason Twill for his Christchurch conversation too. Thank you.